Hello there, good evening everybody and uh, welcome to the Wales Millennium Centre, that's the extent of my Welsh for this evening and I'll uh, uh, leave that to uh, people more expert than myself. Um, my name is Ian Jenkins and along with uh, Griffith Meredith and Justin Lilly, um, we are the organisers of Paddy and Cymru. Um, just to very briefly um, explain what we are, we're, we're a non-political organisation and what we're going to be aiming to do is over the next few years to keep organising events like this where we can look at alternative ideas in economics. So that's really the drive. We think that um, currently, as, as no doubt many of you do, we, we are operating under a dysfunctional um, economic system and what we hope is in these events with <coughs> speakers such as the people that we have on the panel tonight to be able to present some exciting new ideas. So without further ado, I'll um, introduce a few of um, well, all of our panel tonight, I'll introduce a few of them. Uh, first of all, um, Anne Pettifer. Um, Anne is uh, one of the uh, few economists, well not the few, but the few who predicted the uh, debt deflationary crisis back in 2003. So when any, whenever a politician tells you nobody saw this coming, or a banker tells you nobody saw this coming, that's not really true because people like Anne certainly did. Um, she's the author of The Coming First World Debt Crisis, co-author of The Green New Deal, and she's also a fellow of the New Economics Foundation and the director of Advocacy International Limited and the economic think tank Policy Research in Macroeconomics Prime. Um, she's also a familiar contributor to economic debates on programs such as the Daily Politics, so you might recognise Anne from that type of thing. Also more recently, uh, Anne hit the headlines when she described the uh, recovery as being based on an Alice in Wongaland economy. Uh, so you might have come across the, the Wongaland phrase and uh, the author of it is here tonight. They're not very happy. They're not very happy. I can't imagine they are. I can't imagine they are. Next to uh, Anne is Leanne Wood AM, the leader of Plaid Cymru. Under Leanne's leadership, Plaid Cymru have made the Welsh economy the central focus of party policy, with documents such as the Green Print for the Valleys and Plan C outlining new and exciting directions for Wales. This summer, Leanne and some of her colleagues in Plaid Cymru uh, have also been on a fact-finding mission to uh, Mondragon, the Mondragon Cooperative in the Basque region. Uh, to in Spain to discover how a large cooperative movement operates in the modern age and to bring back some lessons for Wales on, on those particular movements. Uh, next along the line is uh, Pippa Bartolotti, uh, the leader of the Green Party in Wales, uh, as, as well as uh, being a campaigner on green issues, including more recently things like anti fracking. Um, Pippa has also sat on the board of several information technology companies. Uh, she writes regularly for the Huffington Post and is a campaigner for various other causes and economic causes, including unconditional basic income, progressive tax policies, and sustainability. And last but not least, uh, all the way from the United States, from Sonoma County, California, is Mark Armstrong, the executive director of the US Public Banking Institute. Uh, Mark has extensive experience in the software industry and specific experience in providing technical strategy consulting his most recent engagement was with the U.S. Postal Service Labour Groups, uh, wishing to use postal banking services to fund the pro proposed National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, Mark's professional experience includes a series of sales, business, development and operations and management positions, first with IBM Finance and then with SAP Technical Development Partners headquartered in Europe. So that's our panel this evening. Um, the order in which everybody's going to speak, we're going to begin with our, uh, our two political leaders. Uh, uh, Pippa will speak first, and I'll share with you Pippa, yeah, that's uh, and then Leanne, and then we'll have our two uh, economic heavy hitters, and, and uh, <coughs> Mark, Mark will speak first, and then Anne will speak last. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your panel.
Positive Money and Ariane Camry for inviting me to speak today. Do you know, this is a really important event. It has the potential to reshape how we think about money, to reshape how money is created, and an event which will give you, the people, incidentally the people are also the real power, remember, the tools for change. So right now in this country, national debt is about 80% of GDP, which itself is 1.2 trillion pounds, which is lots and lots and lots of notes, telephone numbers, we tend to call them. But that is the UK, that's not Wales. Now, the UK, the government of the UK, in their failed attempt to decrease this huge, monstrous debt, has tried austerity and failed. Could this be because austerity was only for the already poor and the increasingly poorer ordinary citizens? None of us need reminding that it was not the ordinary citizen who caused this debt. It was the somewhat extraordinary citizen, the banker. It's difficult to know what austerity must feel like when you're earning more than a million a year and your bonus is even bigger. Wales, just like the other UK regions, finds itself on the wrong side of the divide. This divide has put the accumulation of money ahead of the creation of sustainable work, jobs and industry. And when money is God, <coughs> ethics and morality are unaffordable. Thus, we find ourselves in an ethical and moral mess, as well as a financial one. So monetary and fiscal policy is set in London for us. What would it be like if Wales had control over its own destiny? So, if we take monetary, economy, fiscal policy as a whole, what one person spends is what another earns, and if you cut your spending, someone else is going to earn less. Austerity is about cutting spending, and therefore earning less. An awful lot of these people have found this out the hard way. We must change this. Wales, being the poorest region in the UK, actually, it's poor. West Wales is poorer than Romania, which I find unacceptable. The way things have worked out now, we're never going to catch up with the UK. We may not actually want to. We might find it's just better to change the way we do things. The economic model, the old one, won't help us in Wales. But there are some good pointers for what we need to do. For example, we still have a good manufacturing industry, a good manufacturing output, as they say in economic terms. In fact, Wales is actually running a surplus on its manufacturing output from industry, heavy industry, and other types of manufacturing. And um, I have a figure here that that surplus that we make is 5.1 bin. Now, um, in many ways, seems to me that this money is supporting the catastrophic policies of the Westminster government. In other words, Wales is making a profit which is sucked up by London. The really important things we need to be worrying about right now are, number one, the terrible toll industrialization has taken on the environment. Number two, an urgent need for the construction of clean energy projects for both our energy security and for the health of every person. The third one is a growing population, which is putting a lot of pressure, and will indeed in the future put a lot more pressure on our resources. These things are urgent, but I can tell you for sure 
that none of them will be addressed until we change our banking system. Why? Because the banking system is geared to profit and only profit. Imagine a banking system which was biased towards the greater good. Maybe you can't, but it is possible. You know, people can't be worrying about climate change when they're worrying about the rent or where the next meal will come from. The social dimension to a progressive and self-sufficient economy is vital. That is why we must pay people fairly. That is why we must enable everyone to live free from benefits dependency. That is why the Greens support a citizen's income which would do exactly this. And together with the land value tax and monetary reform, it's no surprise to say all these things are the pillars of Green Party policy. The detail of money, credit and debt will be coming later. I'll leave that to the experts, at least two of which are sitting here. But I would just like to set a bit of a scene for where we are now and how the Greens stand on monetary reform. Well, monetary reform has long been our policy. But just two weeks ago, at conference, which we hold twice a year, and which is the executive body of the entire party, it is the members who make decisions. We made history and called for the end to the private creation of money by banks. This means the Green Party of England and Wales has collectively decided to place this power with a democratically accountable national monetary authority at the Bank of England. Greens are also calling for full reserve banking, which means that banks can only lend out what they actually have on deposit. Instead, we have this seemingly eternal spiral of unsustainable debt creation some might think our policy is radical, but they don't seem very radical to me, just sensible. Citizens' income, land value tax, and of course the decarbonisation de <laughs> the decarbonisation of the entire economy, which we are all too slowly dragging ourselves towards. These are sensible policies. They are actually the only way we can sensibly go forward. Monetary reform is a massive pillar. Now, you may have thought money was the notes and coins in your pocket, and you'd be wrong. 97% of money is just computer digits. How did we come to this? Well, the answer is lending, or to put it another way, debt, as you probably know. I borrow 10 quid from you, you charge me interest. The interest, as yet unpaid, becomes a set of computer digits created out of thin air and rather recklessly defined as money. This system is bonkers. Worse than that, it's actually wrong. So what do we really want from a banking system? A safe place to keep your money is probably top of everyone's list. And that's something we don't have right now. So it's a good place to start. Contrary to popular belief, the current system just isn't safe. When you put money in the bank, they can use it any way they like. Investing in arms dealing, perpetuating war, gambling on food prices, causing terrible shortages and price hikes for those who are already malnourished. And speculating on property, causing house prices to keep on rising beyond the reach of ordinary people. In essence, when you give the bank your hard-earned cash, it becomes theirs, and ethical banks are few and far between. In a sensible world, money would be created by good trade, good business, enterprise. It would be productive. It would help to make stuff we all need, perhaps rather than stuff we're all taught to want. But it doesn't do any of those things. Deregulation of the financial sector has led to ever more speculation, leading to the ever more destructive cycles of boom and bust. A few people get very rich on this, 
the rest of us just carry on. We cough up when they get it wrong. Oh, let's change this. The creation of money has in fact become privatized. Perversely, debt has become socialized. But by that, I mean that the banks make the profits, the bankers get the bonuses, and you and I get to pay for their mistakes through something called austerity, which is the code word for low wages, dirty energy, unemployment, zero hours contracts, bedroom tax. And you know, there isn't even a veneer of democracy around money supply. Decisions about our money supply are taken by just a few dozen bankers at the biggest banks, by the people who have the most to gain by their own decisions. How can that ever be right? We Greeks formally recognize that without ending the debt-based banking system, we can never move away from an economic system that has inequality and unsustainable growth built into it. That is why we wholeheartedly support Positive Money and Ariane Cymru in their quest for a fair banking system accountable to the people it should serve. <coughs> so, if you are committed, like us, to the values of environmental and social justice, and seriously want to end this debt-based monetary system, think very carefully about what is going to be presented to you today. Join the campaign. Because this needs to build into a massive movement if we're going to push any government into change. And we will have to push hard because they're not going to go quietly. It will take a lot of work. It will take a lot of commitment. But you know, it can be done. And I reckon now is a really good time to start. The open bar. to join you here this evening to participate in what is a, a vital debate, I, I believe. Now, as you are aware, I am a politician, I am not a, a banking expert, so I will focus my remarks on general pr principles and uh, to let you know what we in Plaid Cymru want to achieve as opposed to uh, the technicalities which I hope our economic experts here will be able to address if any of you have any technical questions. <clears throat> For me, in this debate, uh, and indeed in all other debates, we must remember that uh, Wales is a nation, and that's an important thing to remember at all times. I probably would say that, wouldn't I? But we are a nation that is made up of thousands of communities, and our nation fits with the patchwork of nations that make up the international community. People in Wales have a role to play in keeping our part of international agreements on human rights, on climate change, and on sharing the world's resources. Wales's borders, of course, are porous. Capital and people flow through them in both directions, and in many ways, that makes all of us richer. In the past, here in Wales, our industrial areas were populated by people who came for work. Ours was an extractive economy which didn't reinvest in the communities which uh, it served, or which served it, uh, rather. Now, Plaid Cymru has called uh, this, the result of this, offers gap, and that is the gap in wealth terms between Wales and other comparable countries. So any overarching long-term policy for Wales must take our history and the existing iniquitous situation into consideration. After more than five years of economic struggle, we are now told that recovery is on the horizon. House prices are rising again. Mortgage lending is growing substantially. Unemployment is down and jobs are up in some places. 
But we understand, don't we, that it's a very uneven recovery. House prices rose by more than 10% in central London in the year up to July. Here in Wales, by contrast, house prices fell in that previous 12 months. With all of the events that have taken place since the Lehman Brothers collapse five years ago this month, we must ask what structurally has really changed in that time? And the answer is very little. When the green shoots are consumer-led and fueled by increasing household debt, and when there are concerns of a new housing asset bubble, then that tells me that the underlying economic fundamentals have not shifted at all. There has been no sectoral or geographic rebalancing of the economy, and there has been a big increase in zero-hours contracts. In fact, we know that inequality is increasing and not reducing. The UK economy still relies far too heavily on London and its financial sector for growth, and Plaid Cymru contends that that is a big mistake. The concentration on financial services to the detriment of manufacturing, for manufacturing is part of the reason we are in the mess that we are in. And of course the banks remain too big to fail. There has not been the Glass-Steagall Act style separation of retail <coughs> and investment banks that would provide security and confidence for ordinary investors and Plaid Cymru has consistently called for that. There's no industrial strategy at either a Welsh or a UK government level. Substantial infrastructure spending, taking advantage of record level low borrowing costs, has not been missed. We've missed an opportunity to reinvigorate the economy and to create employment opportunities. Further, the promised greening of our economy is not happening. Climate change implications are being ignored, jeopardizing future generations. Where progress has been made, like for example the Green Investment Bank, it's been fitful and undercapitalized and therefore ineffective. Where we could and should have learned from previous crises, we haven't. Where is the United States 1930s style New Deal job creation program that Plaid Cymru has been arguing for? We know what helped people get out of debt <coughs> in the 1930s. Why won't we take on those lessons? Instead, it's business as usual. And here in Wales, we know what that means. It means that the Welsh economy will decline even further. So how do we change this? Well, the Party of Wales wants to develop a successful and sustainable Welsh economy. Some proposals on this have been outlined in recent publications. You may have heard about the Green Print for the Valleys. You can find a copy of this uh, on the Plaid Cymru website. And you can also find our Plan C for the Welsh economy. We've been running a campaign on local procurement, encouraging people as well to shop locally so that we can halt the leakage of the Welsh pound out of the Welsh economy, locking in as much of it into our communities as we possibly can. Working together cooperatively, for example, uh, looking at the success of international uh, examples like the Mondragon Cooperative in the Basque Country, which I visited earlier in the summer. Looking as well at what's happening in countries in Scandinavia, there are some very interesting things going on. Of course, finance is a crucial lever in progressing any real public good, and that's why finance powers for Wales are a key part of Plaid Cymru's platform. For some time now, the Party of Wales has called for a Welsh public bank. Our bank would be not for dividend profit, would have the sustainable development of the Welsh economy as a priority. It would have a duty to promote good quality employment in Wales, as well as having a responsibility for stimulating green manufacturing and renewable energy sectors. Plaid Cymru would like to see the bank given the task of expanding our SMEs and promoting those companies that support other Welsh businesses. And we want that bank to be public so that it would not be in the hands of dividend receiving shareholders. There are plenty of questions yet to answer about a Welsh bank and one of those questions is what we do with our public assets. You may not be aware, but we've engaged the services of Ariane Cymru's Dr Ian Jenkins, who has drawn our attention to the Bank of North Dakota. And Ian has argued quite forcefully 
that that model is one that we could use to, in Wales. In this scenario, the Welsh public sector invests its funds with the bank, providing it with asset-backed deposits. And the Federation of Small Businesses tell us that SMEs have substantial problems with the current banking system, with onerous conditions forced upon them, or refusals to lend. The tightening of credit conditions since the recession has made things worse, but this is no new problem for small businesses. The Macmillan Gap, as it's called, is the shortfall in funding to small businesses within the productive economy, named after a committee report from 1931. There have been calls to increase the capacity of credit unions, with local authorities in Wales paying into them a few days early to allow them to accrue greater interest, which they could then loan onwards. With the growth in payday lenders, there's no doubt that our credit union system needs expanding. Credit unions must be part of the solution, but they can't be the only solution. One of the advantages of a Welsh National Bank would give us the ability to use the financial system to our benefit or to the benefit of the Welsh economy. Instead of funding being diverted towards the short-term projects, we could then ensure that it was invested for the long term to provide concrete benefits for the people and the communities of Wales. That has to be the number one goal of any new economic, financial and monetary <coughs> policy for Wales. What delivers the most good to the largest number of people in our communities? It's a very different way of thinking about banking. Now I have given you a flavour tonight as to where Plaid Cymru is coming from, but of course we don't have all of the answers to deal with this economic crisis. In fact, no one does. So we are always open, open to new ideas, new concepts, and new ways of delivering that goal for the people of Wales. So I'm very much hoping to be inspired tonight, not just by the economic experts that we have on the panel, but by you as well. I'm hoping to hear your ideas, and who knows? You might even find yourself in a position of suggesting an idea tonight that might end up in the Plaid Cymru programme of government after the 2016 National Assembly election. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, all of you, for providing me with this platform here tonight. I very much hope that we will see some of the progressive ideas that we will discuss here tonight implemented, and I very much hope that it will be in the not too distant future too. Diolch yn fawr iawn am gwrando. Now to speak to us is uh, Mr. Mark Armstrong, who's come all the way from California, as I said earlier on, uh, from the Public Banking Institute, and Mark's going to talk to us a little bit about the potential of public banking. So I've only been in Wales for just 36 hours or so, and I've got to tell you, the language is the most beautiful language I've heard. I, I, uh, my son is a violinist, and having gone through so many of his lessons, my, my ear has been trained just like his. And uh, so I'm particularly sensitive to, to languages. My other son has, has learned three other languages, and it's just part of our family. But I've never heard Welsh speak, spoken before, and it's, uh, it's quite beautiful. So thank you. Uh, so, uh, Ian uh, and Justin, thank you for inviting me, me here and uh, allowing me to speak at this, at this uh, conference or e event tonight. Uh, you know, this is all about economic sovereignty, and, and as, you, as you look at, at the, uh, the movement that's, that's truly worldwide uh, to throw the shackles off of, of our indebtedness uh, to a very small group of people, uh, it comes down to innovative solutions and models and approaches that we all need to share with one another. And and uh, so I, I'm I'm learning from from the people here in Wales, and I hope to share uh, some good information uh, about what's been done in the United States in the past as as well as uh, uh, present. So we have to know what the problem is we're addressing. The uh, the and and I'll be going into that in some detail. Uh, and, and I've got three case studies I'd like to present and uh, some key reasons why Wales whale should have a public bank. So I was in San Francisco on Monday and just uh, three weeks ago, the, the new San Francisco Bay Bridge opened up 
and uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous bridge. It's, it's five lanes, at least five lanes wide on each side. It's amazingly um, uh, wide. You just can't tell, see it from width to width while you're driving over it. So it's, it's a little uncanny that way. Um, and it, it is quite beautiful. Uh, but it's, it's taken 25 years to build, and nearly 25 years to build. And what's quoted in the paper frequently is the cost associated with that construction. The cost that's always quoted is $6.4 billion, and that's in materials and services. What is never mentioned is the interest cost, the interest in fees. It is, it is not part of the conversation. And you will find here in Wales that that, that debt servicing cost is not part of the conversation either. And, and what was held under the microscope uh, during, you know, 10 plus years ago was labor costs. And yet look at the interest cost on, on this bridge. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to hold up interest costs as the problem we're trying to solve. And let's, let's hold that under the microscope because that is the tax, the hidden tax that uh, a very small group of people are imposing upon us for the use of, of their money. So that's that's the specific problem. Uh, I'm going to go into the larger problem, but I need to clarify something real quick, uh, and that is banks do not lend their deposits. We all think that. We've been trained to think that. Uh, they, they provide a very valuable function. They determine the credit worthiness of, of borrowers. They write a loan into their books on the asset side and they create a deposit or write a check. So basically they're monetizing this future promise to pay. And, and they charge, the, charge interest for bearing the risk of default. So these are three key things that banks do. They do not lend their deposits. And once you realize that the license we're giving to banks is to do these three things, then you have a much better understanding of the nature of lending. Because credit is actually a wonderful thing. It's, it's creating money out of nothing. It's, it's allowing us to, to basically create something that we all assume to be tangible, or, but it, it's not, but it's just a concept. It reminds me, having been in software for 30 plus years, it reminds me of what I used to do in the early 80s in terms of explaining what software was to people. They, people would say, well, I know what hardware is, but what is software? It's the same thing with credit. You know, credit is a concept. And, and it is, it's, it, it's, a, it's a right that we've given to banks. We cannot use bank credit as individuals. When we loan money, it's one-to-one. -one. We are truly, truly lending deposits. So if Ann gives me $100 and I give it to Ian, I'm lending the deposit that Ann gave me. It's one-to-one. It's -one. Banks don't do that. They do not lend deposits. They use the double entry accounting system to create bank credit, which is an asset, and remember deposits are liabilities. They, they, create, they create these assets using double entry accounting system, and that's the heart and soul of the license or the privilege that we've given banks. It's, it's, very, it's kind of no different than a liquor license. You know, we give liquor licenses to, to restaurants, and when they violate, we revoke it. Okay, because it can be misused. And, and a bank credit license can be misused. Because the, what can happen is the deposits they have, they have can be misused and not, not um, used for basically um, uh, offsetting the loans that, are, that are, are created. And many of those loans go to, Brazil, to buy Brazilian bonds or to fund Chinese manufacturers. It goes out of the communities from which they're from. So I'm getting a little off track here, but I, I want to dwell on this because this, if you don't get this concept, uh, you're not going to understand the value proposition of public banking. So I, again, uh, just to use another example, I, frequent flyer miles is a great example. We all are used to that. It's a, it's a different metric. It has nothing to do with actual mileage, but it's a, it's a great metric we use to uh, accumulate theoretically, and we have it in, our, in, our, in the balance in, in the books, and then we cash in 20,000 miles for a seat on an airplane, or whatever the number may be. But those 20,000 miles don't go into a vault with a couple of armed guards in front of it. It's canceled, and th that's the nature of loans. It's created out of nothing, just like frequent flyer miles, and, in, and once you use it up and it's returned to the issuer, it's canceled. 
You can no more run out of money as you can run out of inches. So, <laughs> so, so bankers don't want us to believe that because it's in it for them to think that money is scarce so we go to them for loans because that's how they make, the, they make their money with the interest that's extracted from our economy. So the, the truth, okay, we did that, okay. So there's all sorts of artificial scarcity in our, in our economies right now, whether it's renewable energy. Uh, the, in Montana, there is, uh, and in other places throughout the West, the average age of farmers and ranchers is approaching 60 years old. And for anybody who's lived on a farm or ranch, you know, you have to be pretty young to, to be able to handle it. And so, so there's young farmers and ranchers programs which are created by the government and funded with tax dollars, uh, and they recognize that the government needs to incent people to go back to the land. And so that's a recognition that the existing credit system in our economy has limitations. Bankers aren't really interested in funding something like this. But the government, the state government in this case, understands that that's a margin of the economy that needs to be expanded. And so, so the loan program has been created, and there are all sorts of loan programs that I've seen in, in states throughout the country, throughout the country of the US, uh, as well as in counties and cities. And these loan programs exist precisely because of the limitations of the existing private banking system. And this is one good example. There's, there's quite a need for abundant clear water, for local sustainable agriculture to reduce the carbon footprint of, our, of the food we consume. There's quite a need for, for investment in resource recovery, recycling, for uh, green energy efficient uh, housing, and for uh, transportation mobility. So what's in common with all of those uh, things that I just reviewed. For all, most of them, if not all of them, are metered services. There's a guaranteed revenue stream associated with it. When you, when you go across a bridge that's been built, there's going to be a toll that's going to be paid. And, and the loan is going to be paid off. There's very little credit risk associated with a loan funding this, these type of programs. And yet, what, what, it, what, do our, what does our public finance officials have to do in order to get the money? They have to go to the private market to obtain the money when they could easily create loans on their books, money out of nothing, fund the creation of these, of these projects, and then cancel the debt once the revenue is collected. It is not inflationary because the money that's put into the, into the economy is extracted back with the tolls, etc. So that's the beauty of credit, when it's used well and, and used locally. In Germany, they know this. They are on a tear building out the uh, renewable green, green renewable infrastructure. And they're highly committed to it, and the funding is coming from their public banks, uh, Sparkhausen. And in China, they've known this for years. This was a headline from two and a half years ago. They announced they were going to build 78 new airports. How can they do that? They have their own public banks, which fund it. You know, there are no dummies. They, they know the power of credit and how you, how you can create credit to, to build productive capacity in your communities in order, and, then, and then cancel the debt later on once, once you charge usage fees. So, in, when I talk about wealth in the future, I'm, like, sometimes I'm just referring to productive capacity. We have all been trained as consumers to think of wealth as accumulation of money. But it truly is our ability to produce goods and services that we need in our, for, by all the people in our communities. Okay, and there's lots of examples. We, we all know, know what those are. Money is really a, only a means to an end of that to the end, and, and credit is the way you create money in order to fund that productive, the build out of that productive capacity. So let me go through three quick case studies. Uh, Benjamin Franklin's 300, the anniversary of his 300th year of his birth was uh, in 2006, and the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia commissioned a uh, paper to be written on the birth of paper money. What was interesting about the colonies is that uh, they all 
they all had uh, provincial councils which were issuing currency. There are different uh, decades that, that they started. Uh, but what was interesting about Pennsylvania in particular was it was the first colony to issue, to issue paper money and then to use debt as a way to guarantee it. And I'll, I'll get into that in just a minute. So what, what is essentially happened was there was a permanent peacetime uh, paper money supply for uh, 50 plus years in, uh, in Pennsylvania. When, when Franklin moved to Philadelphia from Boston in 1723, uh, and this is coming right from his um, uh, memoirs, he, he saw many vacant houses, sluggish economic activity, and uh, it, it was basically a recession. And the reason why there was a recession is because the currency that was being used at the time had, had uh, been sent overseas. The manufactured goods had come from you know, probably this town, uh, as well as in England. And, and so the gold and silver coins which were used had been extracted out of the economy and were sent to England leaving a scarcity of, of currency to be used for economic transactions. So the Pennsylvania legislature, or provincial council, issued its first paper money in 1723. It really wasn't that much, but then within nine months, uh, they, is they uh, issued another 30,000 pounds, and, and it was not linked at all to gold, or gold and silver money. And what they did was only lent they only lent a portion of it, a good-sized portion of it, and then spent the remainder for public works. So it was a combination of lending as well as spending uh, for public works, which could be used to pay back the interest. So uh, interest, as, as many of you know, is not created in our current money monetary system. It's just debt. 97% of our money supply is debt. Well, the bankers are great in, in generating debt, but they never issue interest, and so there's artificial scarcity. So, so some people can pay off their debt with interest. The others, there's not enough money in circulation to do it. So, so we're, we're, the system forces people to go into foreclosure, and and uh, in Pennsylvania, they make sure they address that uh, by uh, by issue by actually spending enough money into the economy in order to uh, ensure the interest was paid back. And note, there, was no, there were no taxes to do this. They didn't need to use a tax base. So in seven, in, later on that year, another 30,000 were issued. And this was done uh, repeatedly over the next 50 years. So a, a week and a half ago, I went to the, uh, to the uh, uh, library in Philadelphia and, and took, to, took a look at the minutes for the Provincial Council in 1723. I didn't find the first issuance of, of currency, but I did find the second one. Uh, and, and the minutes were actually documented in a book uh, that was published in 1852. So here's, here's what the minutes say. So this is from 1723. The, the governor sent down for the, for the House of Representatives, which accordingly uh, and, present, and presented to the governor two engrossed bills, the first entitled an act for admitting and making current 30,000 pounds in bills of credit. So what I, what I find fascinating about this is here you have a government entity taking responsibility for the amount of currency that's in circulation with, within the economy. Now we're not used to that. We, we, we let you know, the, the folks who supposedly know all about this to manage them how much money is in circulation. But in the Pennsylvania colony, they, they made their, it, was, it was their provincial council that was directly involved in it. They established a, a land bank to uh, issue that currency as, as mortgage notes, I mentioned. Uh, Franklin notes that after the legislature issued the paper money, uh, everything increased, economic expansion increased. Now, I'm going to be mentioning growth quite a bit. When I talk about growth, I'm not talking about necessarily growth in, in traditional carbon fuel type industries. There are certain margins of the economy that we want to grow as rapidly as Germany is growing their renewable energy area. I mean, we, we definitely want growth in sustainable ag, all those areas I mentioned. Uh, but tr some traditional areas we don't necessarily. So, so what Franklin noted is that, is that there was all sorts of growth as a result of the issuance of the paper money. And so let me, let me switch over to the next, uh, uh, next uh, case study here. So Leanne mentioned the, the New Deal, and 
what's really interesting about the New Deal, and you'll see it in this book. Now, Ellen Brown just published this in June of this year. It's called The Public Banking Solution. There's a whole chapter on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and I highly recommend it. What I like best about this book is that it, it makes public banking normal, and it is like the status quo for the rest of the world except for the UK, Canada, and the United States. But in, in every other part of the world, public banking is considered as, as being something that's necessary. As a matter of fact, Brazil, because of its public banks, is now a creditor to the IMF. Now, we would not read that in our media. But, but uh, Latin America is, is very, uh, they have very strong proponents, including Chile, of their public banking systems that are in place, and they are using public banks to, to further the economic expansion uh, that everyone can, can uh, participate in. So the RFC was uh, founded in the early 30s by President Hoover, uh, and it was an independent corporation arm's length from the Treasury Department. It, it was the heart of the New Deal. Uh, and it, it funded the war effort during the, during the 40s. It was America's largest corporation. It was the world's largest banking corporation. Uh, at the time it was founded, the, the total expenditure for the federal government was less than $5 billion. And it was founded with $500 million in capital. Over the next 20 plus years, it issued over $50 billion in loans. So what was key to its success were self-liquidating loans, they funded the original construction of the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, and uh, there were numerous bridges over the, across the Mississippi River, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania <coughs> Turnpike was funded, uh, and then the California Aqueduct. Aqu Aqu now keep in mind, these are all metered services. They are self-liquidating. They, Even though loans are made by extending credit, there's a guaranteed revenue stream, and the loan will be canceled, so it's not inflationary. You don't need to borrow from the tax base or increase tax rates or cut services in order to save money in order to build out infrastructure. You just use the power of credit in our existing banking system to create the loans that you need in order to build fill in the blank. So there were lots of commercial loans uh, extended as well, uh, over 13,000 loans to small businesses, and uh, there were What's really fascinating about the RFC is that it was, as it was headed by Jesse Jones, um, they just renegotiated loans when there was a problem. They didn't, they didn't force people into foreclosure or force them to default on their loans in any way. There was no economic interest on the part of the RFC to do that. The economic interest on the part of traditional private bankers is to force people into default so that, so that the collateral that's pledged against the loan can be seized. And, and so it's a, it's a different set of incentives when you have a public organization like the RFC responsible for issuing what was at the time a huge amount of lending capacity. There was not a single instance of fraud throughout its 25 year existence. Uh, there was a, quite, a, quite a significant income stream that was returned to the government. And it, it, fun, fundamentally, when you look at Jesse Jones' writings, he was in the business of restoring hope. And he says that explicitly. <laughs> Finally, the third case study I want to go into is the, the Bank of North Dakota. Now, as a bit of history for the Bank of North Dakota, uh, so it was founded in 1919, and uh, what preceded it were, were a number of years where the farmers, and it was primarily an agricultural economy then, the farmers could not sell their crops to the mills, to the flour mills, which were owned by the railroads. But because the farmers could not sell their crops, they defaulted on their, their uh, mortgage notes, which were owned by out-of-state bankers. And the out-of-state bankers foreclosed on the farmers and sold the land for pennies on the dollar to the railroads. So the, the farmers said, enough of this. <laughs> And in one bill, they uh, created the, the uh, state-owned bank of North Dakota. They also created a flour mill that would purchase the, the grain from the, the farmers. To this day, the largest bank in North Dakota is the Bank of North Dakota. 
and the largest mill in the United States is the state-owned bank, uh, or the state-owned mill uh, in Grand Forks, North, North Dakota, the largest mill in the United States. So uh, they definitely wanted to uh, put into place the uh, systems so that they, they uh, won't get screwed again. What song is that from? You know that. The Who, of course. How appropriate. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what they did. And they, in the bill that, that, that uh, founded the Bank of North Dakota, they stated that the state of North Dakota is doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. Now that's a legal term. So that means that the assets of the state can be declared on the balance sheet as the assets of the bank. Hugely important. If you talk to any banker, uh, their biggest issue is capitalization. I was talking with Robin. Where's Robin? Uh, yeah. So that it's, it's the biggest issue with starting up banks, and and it's the incentive for people for banks to get loans off of their books because they want to then free up their <coughs> lending capacity and and better use their their capital in order to make more profits. So because the Bank of North Dakota does not have this issue, they've got they've got tremendous. Uh, uh, capital that they can tap into and recognize on their balance sheet. They can keep their book, their loans on their books. They call it eating their own dog food, where, where they actually create all sorts of loans and keep it on their books. There's no incentives to, to sell it off to other investors. And so it's definitely long-term thinking. It's a long-term investment. And so, so uh, it's, a, it's a very, the fact that they, uh, they have this clause in place is, is quite significant. Uh, the state of North Dakota has no general obligation bonds, and if you talk to folks in North Dakota, my family is originally from there, um, but they're very proud of, of um, not, not spending more than, than they take in. You know, a lot of, a lot of more very conservative folks in, in the United States are, are proud of that. But the fact of the matter is, the reason why they don't need to borrow in the open market is because they have their bank issue loans to themselves. That's the nature of a public bank. So the, the public bank of North Dakota just last year issued a $50 million loan to fund a water pipeline in the western part of the state. They could, they could have gone out and, and funded that with bonds, but they had their state do it. Now just think about the economic transactions associated with that. You've got, you've got the bank issuing this loan, and uh, the, the pipeline's not built yet, but once it's built, the, the um, people receiving the service, the water service, will be paying a rate per month, and that will include the interest. Whatever interest the, the Bank of North Dakota wants to choose to, to, to uh, charge for that loan, the, the money that is collected is, is recognized as profit by the Bank of North Dakota, and, and then where does that money go at the end of the year? It goes back to the taxpayers in North Dakota, so it completes the circuit. You, it's not an extractive model, which is what the rest of private banking is. The, the interest that is charged on the loans from the Bank of North Dakota is returned to the very same people who paid that interest. And so you have a very healthy, sustainable banking model. The uh, state of North Dakota budget is $4.8 billion this past year. The size of the, uh, the Bank of North Dakota's assets uh, is approaching $6 billion. So they're effectively doubling their state budget with their bank. These are big numbers. You can apply that to, to here in Wales. What also is interesting is, in 1997, it was the, uh, in the record books, the second, second most expensive flood in U.S. history. The cost was nearly $5 billion. In Grand Forks, North Dakota, virtually every building and a house was inundated with water. And, and what was, what was uh, most significant about that is that it blew out all of the, the reserves, the, the money that had been set aside by public departments for rain, you know, rainy day funds and such. So, so what happened was within a period of days, state departments ran out of money, and FEMA, which is, which is the U.S.'s uh, way of, of um, at the federal level, of reimbursing people, FEMA would only reimburse people once they had rebuilt their homes. So, so there's bridge funding that needed to take place. Within two weeks, the Bank of North Dakota had loan programs in place to get money in the hands of, of businesses, as well as individuals so that they could uh, reconstruct the city. They also put in place a six-month moratorium on mortgage payments. 
So, just, I mean, here you have a bank acting for the people, you know, putting a moratorium like that into place. And what's really interesting is the 2000 census, was, which was just three years later, Grand Forks, North Dakota only lost 0.2% of its population, and on the other side of the river, where there was no public bank, they lost over 13% of their population. <laughs> So the Bank of North Dakota, I've gone through some of this already. Um, some of their commercial loans are as low as 1% per year. These are commercial loans. And the reason why they do that is because they want certain types of industries, like light manufacturing, in the state of North Dakota, and they use their lending ability to attract businesses. So for instance, there's, there are a number of um, uh, businesses from out of state that are investing in plants in North Dakota uh, precisely because of these loans. Student loan rates, even though philosophically I'm opposed to student loans, but, but nevertheless it's, it's, it's the fact of the matter in, in the United States. And so, but their student loan rates are much less than you find in other states. What's really interesting is that because Bank of North Dakota has 26 loan programs, so remember that balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet that's comprised of loans, they have 26 loan programs. Now, this is the heart. This would be the heart of the Bank of Wales. 20, you know, whatever number of loan programs you would have here, that would be creating credit to build whatever it is you want or to fund commercial businesses. Um, those those 26 loan programs uh, have standards in place, and it's up to the community banks to participate in them. So, so they're not using regulation to. In, to improve the banking system in North Dakota, they're actually using the standards within their loan program. It's a, it's a different approach. It's not the traditional, let's regulate uh, commercial industry or let's regulate the bank. It's, uh, it's using standards to improve the, the, the quality of, of the banking industry. There have been no uh, bank failures in North Dakota for at least 15 years. Um, so even though Bank of North Dakota takes on additional credit risk, uh, and it will say that it takes on additional credit risk because it's, it's funding the margins of the economy that are somewhat overlooked by the private banks. Their loan write-off rate was extremely low, only 0.22% in, in 2010. It was nearly four times as high for community banks. So Bank of North Dakota has, has a very effective way of managing risk, and they just pay attention to it, and frankly what their secret is is to get people in the room and talk and, and renegotiate terms if, if terms need to be renegotiated. And then uh, they're, they're generating all sorts of profit. But here's the key thing that Bank of North Dakota gives to the state of North Dakota, and this would be true for Wales as well, if you had a bank. It gives, it gives the people, it would give the people of Wales, here it is in North Dakota, a seat at the table. It gives you access to low cost deposits to fund those 26 loan programs. We don't have access, you know, at, without a banking license. You need a banking license in order to get access to low-cost funds. End of story. If you don't have that banking license, you're always going to be having to negotiate in a, you know, one with one arm be tied behind your back uh, because you're, you're looking for the best rate, and the best rate is always going to be higher than what bankers can get through their existing private banking network. <coughs> so this is the final slide. Uh, why Wales should have a public bank. You will be asked by lots of people why the, uh, the, the why Wales should have its own public bank. And in my opinion, you're, you're going to have multiple answers to this. There's only one answer, because and, I, and I've gone through this in the States quite a bit. The only answer you should, you should say is it will reduce or eliminate debt servicing costs. It saves money. Nobody will argue with you on that. All right, and if they, if they do, then they're really defending the existing system, which is atrocious, because once you find out what your debt servicing costs are in, are in Wales, they're, they're as high as what, well, maybe they're not as high as what we're paying in California, but they're very high, I would imagine, because public finance has been completely privatized uh, throughout the world, and, and there's no true public finance unless, unless you have a public bank. And in North Dakota, they put their deposits in their own bank, and that makes them less dependent upon uh, uh, private financiers. And the same thing would be true in Wales. Uh, the, other, the other key thing to, to mention is that you actually eliminate the risk of putting money into too big to fails 
these are public monies. Given, given the derivatives bubble, given what happened in Cyprus six plus months ago, it's really important that public monies are not put into private banks. Uh, because uh, there's, there's, the risk is that there, the risk is that the, the deposits can be used to capitalize the bank. Banks do not, cannot uh, go bankrupt like our like normal businesses. Banks are now allowed to, when they make bad loans, they can say, hmm, what am I going to do? I think I'll, I, the taxpayer is not going to bail us out anymore. Okay, so that's clear. So what I'm going to do is seize my deposits uh, that, that are on the books and turn that into capital and then I'll be back in business on Monday. They have the right to do that based upon legislation that, my, that the, the United States, or it's not legislation, so it's a working paper right now, but uh, it certainly was allowed in, in Europe with, with Cyprus. And so the, 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 the public deposits that are on, in, in private banks can be seized and turned into capital, and, and because of that, there's tremendous systemic risk associated with with putting public monies into private banks. Uh, the third reason would be to fund businesses like cooperatives. There are all sorts of new, new ownership models uh, that are coming into place with the new economy. And, and the thing that is missing from the equation is funding, debt capital that can be provided to these businesses that have new ownership models. I mean, as, a, as an example, if you look at a co-op, you know, usually the thing that's missing from the equation is money. And many times, if you have a private financier, they, they want ownership, or at least control, of, of, that, of that business. Well, if a public bank is in existence, it can make loans to fund co-ops without that level of control being ceded to it. And then finally, funding sustainable ag and renewable energy is, is absolutely critical uh, for all of our communities, and uh, a public bank can do that. So with that, thank you very much.
which is the mother of all banks, the mother of all central banks. His name's Cacetti, and he tells a story. He, he explains it this way. He says, you know, if you're standing on the beach and you want to measure the tide and work out how high the tide is going to come up, if you're an economist, what you do is you look at shoals of fish just inside, you know, the shore, seashore, and you model the shoals of fish. You model the way in which they're moving around. And there you are focused on the finite and infinite movements of these fish when you should be looking at the moon. <laughs> and that's been the problem in economics, right? And it's a very, very big problem. And it's the problem which means that you and I regard money and the creation of money is incredibly puzzling. And I, I can imagine you sat and listened to this this evening and thought, hell, is that true? You know, really, just honestly, I don't understand. Because we deal with money on an everyday basis. We have it in our pockets, a tangible thing. We do it all the time, and yet we don't understand what it is. So I want to try tonight to just begin to explain. And I want to start by saying I'm going to disagree with everyone here on the panel. And not with everything that everyone has said, but with quite a lot. First of all, I think credit creation is a bloody wonderful thing. Okay? It's a great civilizational advance to have a, a modern, Monetary banking system is a great thing. And I speak with deep feeling about this because I've worked in Africa where they don't have monetary systems, where they don't have banking systems, they don't have the legal system to back up a contract, they don't have criminal justice systems to catch the bad guys who don't honor their contracts, they don't have accounting systems, and they therefore don't have money. In a modern monetary system, well developed, the great thing about it, the most amazing thing about it, is there's never, ever a shortage of finance. You can never <coughs> say there ain't enough money. And I thought what Mark said was rather wonderful when he said, you know, it's like saying there's not enough inches. I try and explain to people what money is. And now, honestly, I have, I have real difficulty with really very, very clever people. Money is not the value for which we exchange things. Money is the value by which we exchange things. And it's a bit like saying, I'm going into a shop to buy a yard of silk. And money is the measure of that silk. But I don't come out of the shop with a yard of silk and measure. I don't come out with a tape measure made of silk. I come out with a piece of silk, a yard of silk, which I have measured, or which the shop has measured. Now, we have to have a system where somebody checks whether or not the tape measure is, in fact, a yard long, and that the guy selling the silk hasn't kind of shortened his tape measure so that I get less than a yard. We need a system that checks on that, just as we need a system that makes sure the brewer sells us a pint of beer. And you know, when you have a little mark on the beer, the pint of beer, in case they give you less than a pint, right? We need a system that manages that measuring process. But the measure is not the beer and it's not the silk, thank God. The thing that's really valuable is the silk. Money is the measure by which we exchange things. Okay. It's hard for us to understand because we have evolved so far from where money first began, we've forgotten what it is. We're so busy just using it and making it and accumulating it, whatever, we forgot what it is. There's a wonderful book called 5,000 Years of Debt, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, by a fellow who's an anthropologist, actually, and he's actually the, he's an anarchist, he's just been made a professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics, but he's a founder of the Occupy movement. He's the one who started all the trouble back in Wall Street, Wall Street Occupy. And I have disagreements with him as well because he's an anarchist. But his book is wonderful because he explains that we've had 5,000 years of debt. And it had nothing whatsoever to do with barter. What happened was we lived in little villages and we said, I'll help you thatch your cottage if you'll help me collect wood for my fire. We'll have an agreement. And I'll be helping you thatch your cottage. Your, your, your hut, and um, come the time I want to collect wood from the forest, you don't help out. 
Well, then there's someone in the village, probably a priest or some kind of a figurehead, who says, hang on, you've got to get you owe this guy. You'd better go and help him carry the wood from the forest. That's when credit began. And that's what credit is. What used to happen, David Graham tells us, in the olden days was, when a stranger came to the village and wanted to do some deal with them, then barter would be involved. Because who was the stranger? Could you trust him? Could you make sure that he would repay his debt at some point? No, because he was going to move away. So you bartered with him. But within the village, you exchanged credit. Credo. I believe. I believe him. I thatch your roof. You're going to help me collect wood from the forest. Credit. Credit. That's the basis of it. Credit is just trust. So when the banks in the, in, the, in the United States made loans to subprime borrowers, women who were hairdressers earning $7 an hour and who were living in some awful apartment somewhere where the roof was leaking, and wanted their own place. And the banker comes along, the agent of the bank, and he says, look, you can have $300,000, it's no problem. And she says, but I only earn $7 an hour, only a hairdresser. He says, yeah, no problem, 15%. And he charges her 15% because he doesn't trust her, and he's right, to be able to repay. And he's damn right, because she can't repay. But it is a sin, it is a mortal sin to take 15% off a woman who's earning $7 an hour whom you know will never be able to repay. But why you can't take it off her, it's very big money. It's good money and it's money earned effortlessly. And that money, that subprime debt was the basis of Goldman Sachs then set up some collateralized debt obligations where they put all those risky mortgages together with a few other mortgages. They bundled it up and they sold it off as an asset and they made even more money out of that interest. For me, that is a mortal sin. That is evil, right? And that's what our system did. So the thing is that money is the measure of trust twixt you and me. And when I don't trust you, the cost of lending to you rises. And the rate of interest, therefore, is the price of my loan to you. And that rises in so um, what I want to focus on tonight is the rate of interest, because I know that there are people here from small businesses. We know that on average, um, a business doesn't make more than 3% profit a year, over time. Sometimes you can make 10%, sometimes you make a loss. One year you make a loss, the next year you make 10%. But on average, historically, over time, we all know, Businesses make profits of no more than 3% a year. If the rate of interest is above 3%, you're bankrupting all those businesses, right? So the rate of interest on this trust, the level of trust that we've got to have between us, for us to be sustainable, and that's why it's so important to the Green Party and why the Greens are so right to focus on that, is that it must always be low. It must always be at least below 3%. I would like to see it lower. Because you can't make profits. <laughs> Of more than three percent, but I but I'm rushing ahead of myself. I want to start with a bigger story, and I really hate that I can't see people. Can I move this around a bit? Um, <coughs> the, the story that our politicians are telling us now, that I think is so important to you. I have to tell you, I worked with the local authority of Newport about ten years ago on how, trying to regenerate Newport, and today I drove past the in the train past Newport. And actually, it just tore at my heart. There's Newport, looking depressed. I reckon unemployment there is probably pretty high. It looks a bit dreary. It could do with a lick of paint. The idea that there aren't people in Newport that couldn't rebuild Newport to make it look good. The idea that you couldn't have a wonderful river development scheme alongside the river. This is crazy. Of course you can. We're all capable of doing this. We know how to do it. We're not short of bricks and mortar here in Wales. Bricks, you don't need. You don't need, I don't know, to make bricks and mortar, I can tell you, is very, very easy. You can make it from the soil. We can do it. We've got labor. I believe we've got unemployment of more than 8% yet. There are people who are idle. They could be fixing Newport. But what do our politicians, politicians tell us? They tell us there is no money. And so I want to start on that note. Um, am I going right here? Where am Space I going? Bar. Yes? Space bar. Space bar. There we go. 
So here's Mrs. Thatcher. She's the one whose, whose economics, believe it or not, is still rarely dominant. We get it across the political spectrum. She tells us, and Mark has just told us how this is not true, that the state has no source of money other than the money that people earn themselves. We create the money, apparently. If the state wishes to spend more, it can only do so by borrowing your savings. So she's implying we'll rob you or by taxing you more. And it's no good thinking that someone else will pay. That someone else is you, said Mrs. Thatcher. There is no such thing as public money. There is only taxpayers' money, said she said. Now, this was back in 83. You'd have thought the story would have died. No. Liam Byrne, the <laughs> Labour advisor, says, Dear Chief Secretary, he says, I'm afraid to tell you, there's no money in the bank. Mr. Osborne tells Sky News, the British government's run out of money because all the money, he says, was spent in the good year. So we have this thing about how there ain't no money, and yet we all know, we're all clever since 2008, because we found out that somehow or other, the central banks have found in the United States, the calculation is $16 trillion to bail out the banking system. And you know what? Not a penny of that was raised from taxation. Not a penny. They couldn't do it. They wouldn't have had time to do it. To bail out layman's, they had to find the money overnight. You know, the Federal Reserve had to create the money literally overnight. They couldn't wait to go around collecting taxes from the people in order to bail out layman's. So Mr. and I've got some quotes here from Mr. <coughs> Mervyn King and so on, but you heard all the story. You know, the equivalent of the whole of our annual income was spent, a trillion pounds to bail out the bank. Never in, and uh, Mervyn King said, never in the history of all kinds, of, so few people owed so much to so many, right? Now, they haven't taken our taxes to do that because they didn't taxes to do that. So we can't complain too much, really. What they did ask for was that we should guarantee them forever. So what we've given them is guarantees, licenses. We've said, look, don't worry, you'll never fail, Mr. Barclays. You'll never fail, Mr. HSBC. You can mess around as much as you like. We are putting our guarantee behind you. And after all, there's how many billions, how many millions of us, and you know, there is a tax revenue stream coming forward into the future. You don't have to worry. So we've given them a really wonderful guarantee. And you know what? In return, we asked for nothing. Our spineless politicians have said, here's the guarantee. No terms or conditions. <laughs> when I give my son a loan, you know, I say to him, look, sweetheart, you can have this money, but I expect you to put your nose to your studies. I expect you to come up with a degree at the end. So, you know, there are terms and conditions, even in the family, but not for the bankers. There ain't no terms. Of, you can have the guarantee. Do as you please. Our politicians are actually spineless. You know why? That's because we're ignorant, because we don't put any pressure on them. So the economic orthodoxy, all these economists are focused on shoals of fish going around and modeling them. They assume that money or credit is like a commodity and it's therefore subject to market forces, supply and demand. So the assumption is that the rate of interest is subject to market forces too. That, you know, because it's a commodity like gold or silver or copper or cigarettes or whatever it is that you're going to make as your money, you can run out of it. It can become scarce. Well, you know, if that's your model of what money is, then of course it's subject to supply and demand. And anything that's scarce becomes more expensive the scarcer it gets. Okay. But in reality, we know that this is wrong. So they, they argue that the <coughs> rate of interest, they said, this rate of interest which I regard as incredibly important to the economy. There's no way that Wales is going to be able to invest and revive without a very low rate of interest. Mm -hmm. so that, I just want to say, Mark's absolutely right, and I have to just disagree with positive money in some respects on all of this. The banks do create money out of thin air, and thank God they do. Thank God for that $16 trillion, because you know what? We were at a point where the banks were going to close, you know, the hole in the wall was going to be closed shut. Can you imagine the chaos? 
Can you imagine the chaos, the social upheaval that would have happened? So, thank God they did that. So they can create credit out of thin air. And that is a good thing. But it means there is no limit to the amount of credit that can be created. And when there is no limit to something, its price, as Keynes argued, should be very, very low. When something is scarce, you understand why its price goes up. The credit is without, can be without limit. Let me just go through this. So for me, the rate of interest is not a, a, the result of the demand for savings, that I put savings in the bank, and I would like your savings, and you don't want to, you don't uh, want to part with your savings unless I pay you a lot of money. And the rate of interest is instead the need uh, of, of people with resources to decide where to put their money and how liquid to make their money. And this is John John Keynes, um, John Maynard Keynes' liquidity preference theory. And it's a very different idea of money because he understands credit money and bank money. He understands that credit is the measure by which we exchange goods and by which we store, we have a store of value. It's not based on a commodity. But let's not get too complicated. So the point about credit, money, and finance, the great thing about it, the really wonderful thing about it is man-made. It is a social construct. We can do something about it. We don't have to be victims of it. We can control it. We can manage it. The rate of interest is man-made as well. You know, they, they were telling us about how, no, the rate of interest is just decided by market forces, supply and demand. And then we discovered something called LIBOR. Now, I bet none of you had ever heard of the London Interbank Offer Rate before you heard of Mr. the way Mr. Barclays in the back room was manipulating that rate. Well, of course he was. You know, the, the rate of interest is not a, a product of supply and demand. If you can make money out of nothing, if you can create credit out of nothing, then you can fix its price. And you fix its price depending on whether you're giving money to the lady who is earning $7 an hour as a hairdresser and has no assets, or if you're giving it to this person who's saved up a lot of money and has got three houses. There's going to be a difference in the way in which you price the risk of those two borrowers. And that's the only thing uh, that happens. And of course, that's how, and banks, quite rightly, that's what they live to do. That's why we have bank clerks to sit there and say to you, do you really think you can pay for this loan? I remember when we first took out a mortgage in the 70s, I'm very old, it's a long time ago, and my husband and I both had to go to see the bank manager. And we had to sort of make a commitment that we would stay married for 25 years. I have to tell you, I have to tell you, we didn't uphold that commitment. But you know, he probed the, the, the state of our relationship. He asked us about the value of our house. He asked us about the nature of our income. He asked us about our education. He wanted to check that we could repay our loan. Now, when my son goes for a loan, he more or less gets it from someone who's a voice at the end of the phone. Right? No, there might be some way for calculating his risk, his riskiness, but actually. It's not nearly as rigorous as it was when I first went for it. And that's what bank clerks are for. We should, that's what they should be doing. We should be keeping them busy doing that kind of thing. So the rate of interest is man-made. It's a social construct. Um, here I go. Sorry about this. I'm stuck. Next. Uh, the space bar. Ah, the space bar. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, and Mark has already said that banks don't lend deposits. It's not a kid ourselves. You don't need to have deposits in the banks in order to lend. Thank goodness. Okay. They don't lend out reserves. Reserves are what the central bank gives to banks in exchange for assets like bonds in order that banks can clear their debts between them. So when the, when the bank creates credit for you and me. And I've got a quote here from Ben Bernanke, in which he, let me find it for you, because I think this is a really important quotation, and it'll help you understand. So what happens is, Ben Bernanke gives the first ever television interview that ever any governor of a federal bank has ever given. You know, the Americans, you have to give them credit. They're very transparent. So he comes on, and this is March 2009, and the day before that, he bailed out an insurance company called AIG to the tune of 
$160 billion. That is a load of money. There were two things really worrying about this. First of all, AIG was not a bank. It was an insurance company. It should never have had an account with the Federal Reserve. That should only be for banks, okay? But it was in such a mess, it was going to bring down Goldman Sachs, everybody. It was going to bring down the whole global system. So he quickly fixed for them to have an account with the Fed. You know? Didn't do that for me. Didn't do that for you. Did it for AIG. They had to give him $160 billion. So the German says to him, Mr. Bernanke, um, where did you get $160 billion from? Was it tax money, he says. And Bernanke says, and quote, you can find this up on the web, it's not tax money. The banks have accounts with the Fed, much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. To, so to lend to a bank, because he lends to banks, we simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account that they have with the Fed. <laughs> right? Uses the computer. Now, when you go and apply for a loan, your bank does exactly the same thing. But it does a bit more. It says, hang on guys, you want £300,000 for a mortgage? Have you got any collateral? Yeah, I've got a flat. You know, it's worth so much. Okay, can I have my hands on your collateral? Second here, here's a form for you to sign. I promise to repay this debt over 25 years. Third, here's the rate of interest on this debt. Sign there too, please, okay? When you've done all that, they enter numbers into a computer and they charge it to your account. Wonderful, that means you've got 300K with which to find a roof over your head. Now all you have to do is go and work to repay it, okay? Now, if it's a viable rate of interest, and if your, your, your income is viable and it rises at a, a decent level, you can repay that loan. And as Mark said, it's a wonderful system when it works. Credit comes from nowhere. It's fixed, hopefully at a low rate of interest. It generates economic activity, right? You've now got a house to live in. That means you can hire the painter, you can hire the builder, you can put in a new bathroom. That's creating economic activity. Those three guys get employment. That generates income. You go and get a job. You've got income. You repay the money, and it's a virtuous circle. It has to be kept virtuous by keeping the rate of interest low and by making sure that the money goes into productive activity. Okay. If I take that money and I gamble on the lottery, well, I might make, I might win a million dollars, but I may lose it all. So Keynes and all sound economists argue that this credit creation power, if it's invested in productive activity, should create economic activity which then repays the debt. That's a stable system, but that's what has to be managed. And the reason it has to be managed is that when you give banks that huge power, what are they going to do with it? They can go and play. Because why on earth do you want to give money to a small firm in Wales that promises it's going to do something amazingly innovative and hire a few people and pay it back? Why would you bother to do that? Because you know you've got to go and check on them, you're looking around, things don't look good here, it's austerity, all that stuff. Why shouldn't you take your money and gamble on the fact that bond rates might rise, or that you know, gold price might fall, or that you know there's this movement like this in some commodity price. Because you know, when you do that, it costs you nothing. You don't have to sweat. You just wait there and you sit there and the money comes rolling in until it doesn't. Okay. So, so the effort of speculation, you know, to speculate requires far less effort and you can make a lot more money very quickly. The effort of investing in productive activity, well, it could take 30 years for you to repay that mortgage. Do I want to sit around for 30 years while you repay your mortgage? No, I want to go and play in the global capital markets and make a quick buck. And what Keynes argued, and this is why I'm a Keynesian, we're not allowed to let, we should not let bankers do that. We have given them the great power of looking after this thing we call trust, which measures the way in which we exchange goods between us, the way in which we hold our wealth. We've given them that great power. We've got to tell them to manage it in our interests, not just in their own. Now, they used to do this. 
You know, we've had periods of stability in banking. You know, the fact is, when the banking system evolved, and especially here in Britain, we were amazing innovators and entrepreneurs and industrialists. The Industrial Revolution started here, not just because we had brilliant engineers, but because we had bankers. In economies where they didn't have them, we didn't have a banking system. They couldn't get the finance to do something really risky, like invent a steam engine. They couldn't, they couldn't get the finance to do something really dangerous, like financing a trip in a ship across to a place called Australia. Okay, Really risky uh, enterprise there. Nobody knew how it was going to turn up. So they needed finance for that, and they needed it to be sustainable. They couldn't have a huge rate of interest on that loan because it might not work out. But if it did work out, great, you get a steam engine and you find a new continent. Okay. So the reason that the Britain was so innovative was because we had a banking system. So these, these, this is a really good system, but it has to be managed. So when it was managed, it was stable, it led to great progress, great human progress. But when it's out of control, it leads to massive destruction. And the period that I'm most interested in is period 1933, as Mark said, to 1971. 1929, we have a huge financial crisis, exactly the same thing that happened. The banks that had been allowed to let rip, they were given control over credit, they lent money like there was no tomorrow, people borrowed crazy money, and this time they, they invested in the stock market. And the New York stock market went boom like this. People did crazy things to buy shares. And they invested in those, all those shares, they went mad. There was a huge boom, and then boom, it all crashed. Why? Because they borrowed money to gamble on the stock market, and then the money became too expensive. The, the interest on that money became too expensive, and it, and, it, and it caused them to go bust, basically. And I'll go into that in a minute. So what Keynes and Roosevelt, to his credit, do is they say, hang on, guys. We've had, since 29, four years of austerity, four years of hell, we've got to fix the system. And he wasn't, Keynes really wasn't able to act here until Roosevelt came to power. And Roosevelt was a politician of immense fiber, you know? He was an aristocrat, and I think that's why he had the confidence he had. But he, um, but he decided to take on the banks. His inaugural speech is one of the most moving speeches I've ever read. And in it, he says, the thing we've got to do, guys, is to chase the money lenders out of the temple of our democracy, he says. And he closes the banks the next day. And he then introduces regulations. So what Keynes, Keynes did the same thing in 1933 here. They get control of the banking system effectively through the Treasury and the Bank of England. Keynes teaches the, the Treasury and the Bank of England how to manage interest rates across the spectrum, not just for short term, not just for base rates, but for medium and for long term rates, and stabilizes the banking systems, lowers interest rates. And with those policies, Britain is able to raise the finance it needs to go to war. You know, it's really interesting. We're never short of money when we have to go to war, right? And we go to war and we, 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 we win the war, basically. Um, and that's very largely due to Keynes. And then between 45 and 71, the Keynesian system, the Bretton Woods system, is in place. And it's a place for, man it's, a, it's, a, it's a time for managing the creation of credit, managing the rate of interest, and managing an economy, a banking system, so it serves the economy. And pretty soon, back, Keynes dies soon after the war. Pretty soon, the bankers are back. And they say to the politicians, Actually, you know what? You guys don't really know how to run the system. Give it to us. We know how to run it. But they are pushed back. They're pushed back until 1971. And in 1971, Anthony Barber introduces competition and credit control, which the economists call all competition and no control. And under competition and credit control in 1971, the banks are given the freedom to create credit as they like and to fix the rates of interest as they like on that credit. And that begins the long, slow process of building up this massive credit bubble, which bursts first in 2001 and then in 2008. And in fact, there are bubbles that are burst, that burst on the way up there, the 1987 bond market bubble and so on and so forth. But the big ones are 2001 and 2008. So we have lived, some of us, through a period when we managed the banking system and when we 
had stability. And when the banks were so creative that they could help and support economic activity and create employment. And then we've lived through a period when that's gone bust. We can go back again. And I want to say this, you know, we don't even have to nationalize the bank. To be honest, I don't think you need another bank in Wales. All you need is to manage and regulate the banks. You need to say to them, sorry, you cannot have this license. You cannot have this guarantee unless you do as we say unless you agree to this kind of regulation. That's all you have to say. I'm against a new bank, because the bankers would love another bank, I can assure you. Um, I think we can take our existing banks and regulate them. We've done it before, and we can do it again. What we need to do is understand what enormous powers they've got, what they're doing with that power, and get a grip on it, and get our politicians to start you know, stiffening their spines. That's all we need to do to get a bank that will work in the interest of Wales and that will do something about renewing Newport. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Well, I'm sure you'll agree we heard four very interesting and quite varied presentations there on the possibilities that we can consider for the future.